Underwriting for Auto Line this week, provided by. If you want to make things that move, move better, just talk to one of our scientists. They'll show you a special glue we've developed that bonds metal to plastic. And that makes the things you're trying to move lighter. The less weight, the less energy. And what you save can be used for speed, for efficiency, or just for fun. This is the Human Element at Work. Down. From the Auto Line Studio, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on Out of Line this week, where the discussion today is going to be all about climate change as it impacts the automotive industry. Is the industry doing enough? Can it even do more? We've got a very interesting author joining us today. The author of the book, Driving the Future, written by Margot Ogay. And Margot, in case you don't know her, has got quite the pedigree background. She's a former director of the Office of Air and Quality at the Environmental Protection Agency. She's a board member of the National Academy of Sciences and on the International Council for Clean Transportation. And Margo, I want to thank you for joining us on Autoline this week. Nice seeing you, John. I used to see John at the Washington uh, Auto Show every year. Yes, you did. And I miss you, so it's good to be back it's great to have you here <laughs> in Detroit. The with us. Yes. Also joining us today are Frank Marcus with Motor Trend, and Frank, it's great having you back on the show. Always today. a blast. So, Margo, let, let's start out. You, your, your book is very interesting, by the way. I, I would even recommend it for climate skeptics because you lay out the whole history of how this whole climate change debate came about, going back well over 100 years. Yes. I found that fascinating. But my question is, you were at the EPA. You, you helped in, uh, enact a whole lot of uh, regulations there. Is the industry making progress? I mean, w- we, we all hear that it needs to do more, but yeah. when you yeah. turn around and look back at where we've come from, what can you say that we've really yeah. accomplished yeah. so far? Well, first of all, um, just, just imagine that for the last three decades, uh, there has been a lot of effort to throw doubt about the science of climate change and to throw a lot of scare tactics to scare the public about the cost of acting to reduce the impacts of climate change. And it wasn't until 2009 when the first historic action took place in this country, and it was cars. It was to reduce significantly the greenhouse gas footprint of cars and light duty trucks from 2012 to 2025, actually doubling the fuel economy to 54.5, this is cafe for, the, for your expert space, and half the carbon footprint. And it happened because the willingness of the car industry to step forward, no other industry has done that yet, by the way, and have a historic agreement with the White House, two federal agencies, EPA and the Department of Transportation, and the state of California that some of us think it's another country. So to answer your question in a long way, yes, the industry is making huge efforts and we're seeing it today. Um, I just turned my, my, my first vault and I got my second vault. Uh, a fantastic car, I recommend it to everybody. But I checked my odometer to see what I had done, 42 months. I have been driving it, 200 miles per gallon, an extraordinary vehicle. Uh, and, and I don't have to tell you when you walk to the, to, to the dealers what you can see today, you know, more efficient gasoline engines. Uh, there are 67 alternative powertrain models in the market today. Uh, electric cars, uh, the industry uh, is doing a lot and the consumer is responding. So it's all good up to now. Uh, were you ever hopeful that, in addition to the coordination with the industry and so forth, you might have a little help on the customer pull side with increased gas taxes or things like that, which have been so effective in Europe at getting at driving fuel economy demand? So you are absolutely right. When you go to Europe, there are all kinds of taxation schemes and also incentives uh, for uh, the consumer to drive a more efficient car, i.e. diesel, very often, or a smaller engine that is less polluting. Uh, You know, this is my adapted country, uh, but I have lived in Washington for 32 years. 
actually 34, worked for 32 years in the government, 34 years. And the idea of raising gasoline taxes uh, for the representatives, congressional representatives, it is a political suicide. But you're absolutely right that, you know, with, I mean, we think the consumers responding uh, to purchasing more fuel efficient vehicles when gasoline price, price is increasing. But I'm not optimistic uh, that the U.S. Uh, is going to increase the gasoline taxes at the national level. Now, at the state level, it's a whole different story. Margo, what do you think is going to happen, though? Because, uh, as you noted, there's all kinds of alternative powertrains out there, hybrids, plug-ins, electric cars, even a little bit of fuel cells yeah, out yeah. there right now. But the public so, has not bought these things the way that some others thought they would, if you look back five years ago, what the predictions would be. Yeah, yeah. And it's a global issue. Yeah. It's not just in the United States. How is the automotive industry going to hit the goals that yeah. regulators yeah. like yourself yeah. has set for it yeah. if the public's not going along and yeah. buying these cars in the necessary numbers? Yeah. So, first of all, let me say that the race for more fuel efficient and greener cars is not just the U.S. race. You know, it's across the planet. In these days, we're not talking about, well, let's... Uh, regulate fuel efficiency just because of energy security issues. We're doing it for climate change uh, because we should be thinking of a planet that has zero carbon, zero fossil fuels, and that should be the goal. Uh, but also we're doing it because, I mean, your best way of keeping gasoline prices low is, is less demand. Uh, gasoline is the only product that I can think of where there is monopoly in the transportation sector. Okay, when gasoline prices are high, Guess what happens? Everybody suffers because you cannot go somewhere else. Uh, when you don't like Coca-Cola because it's more expensive, I mean, you go to Pepsi. Uh, and the CEO of Pepsi is a good friend of mine, so I do drink Pepsi. But, you know, you have choices as a consumer. When it comes to transportation, you know, over 90% of the, of the energy sources we're using is gasoline. So, so to the consumers, what I say is let's keep the gasoline prices down by having less demand of gasoline. Um, you know, and, not, and let's not forget what has happened for, for 100 years is investing on the internal combustion engine. And today, I mean, if you look at cars today, the companies are even doing better than the rules require them. I mean, 2014, the cars were sold, 34% of them met the 2016 or 2017, you know, cafe standards. Uh, and another thing that we need to remember is that the 2025 standard is 97% of the actions that will take place is all based on the internal combustion engine. We, we assume in government 1 to 3% only of strong hybrids and electric cars. So it's re I mean, that tells you how much room exists for having more efficient uh, internal combustion engine, smaller engines, turbocharging, lighter weight materials, and this is all that what we are seeing today. It, just, it seems to me, though, that the, the, the gas price, as you say, yeah. we keep the price low by reducing the demand yeah. or whatever, that stifles the, the you know, evolution of other, uh, you know, cellulosic ethanol and all these things that are pretty profitable at $100 a, gal a barrel oil. But they're terrible at yeah, 50. Yeah, yeah. And so are we sort of, you know, cutting the, the, d the development of this, the one side by keeping the, the fuel yeah. so low? Yeah. So, so I mean, for, I, and I, we can have a whole discussion on cellulose because I manage the Renewable Fuel Standard Program for the agency. Uh, the experts that I have discussed gasoline price, by the way, I'm not a, an oil expert. Uh, but if you look at the history of gasoline prices, and you look what is happening today, one has to believe that this is a temporary situation. You know, maybe 2015 we're going to see low gasoline prices, but 2016, 2017, that's not going to be the case. So we need to look at this on a long-term basis. This is not uh, a year increment. We're going to look at this year. The gasoline prices are low. We're going to you know, relax the standards, for example. We're not going to invest on in advanced technologies because both of you know that investing on in advanced technologies is a long effort. It's not one year effort or two years effort. Uh, and I think of the EV1. If we 
Just imagine what would have happened today, and, and some of the GM colleagues are saying the same thing. If we had not stopped EV1, where would this country be? But we had a short-term view, uh, and you know, GM and others decided at the time not to support it. So we need to look at this issue on a long-term basis, because 2025, in my view, is just the first step. And if we are to address climate change, if we address air pollution, Mega, the growth of mega cities, you need to move beyond 2025. You both raised the, the topic, cellulosic ethanol. Okay. I've been waiting for this to happen in a big way because as you point out in your book, Margot, the fastest way to reduce carbon dioxide output is reduce the amount of carbon in the yeah. fuel. Cellulosic ethanol, one of the ways to do that. There's a lot that's been re- written negatively about corn-based ethanol. Yeah. Cellulosic, as you know, we can make that from garbage. And I've always said if America can make fuel out of garbage, we're going to be number one for a long time to come. But it's never happened, or it's not happened in the volume that everybody was talking about. I mean, if you go back six, seven years ago, we thought we'd have a lot more cellulosic ethanol. What's the holdup? So so that's a very good good, uh, question, John. Um, What happened in 2007 when Congress passed the 2007 Energy Act and President Bush signed it into law, the the Congress vision, uh, a pretty aggressive penetration of cellulosic fuels. And they... You know, I believe that a year ago, the level was like a billion gallons, and I don't believe we had any commercial uh, cellulosic. I think this may be the first year. There's going to be maybe 30 million gallons, a very small volume. So the the Congress thought that the innovation is going to happen sooner than it happened. Uh, I am a pretty big uh, supporter of cellulosic. I think it's a matter of time and also funding. Funding because many companies have gone under both government funding and private sector funding to s- continue to see the growth of cellulose. Because at the end of the day, yes, you can make ethanol from corn in a way that is sus- more sustainable. You can use natural gas or alternative means of, uh, of energy to produce ethanol. But your best way for low carbon fuels is to have a feedstock that doesn't comp- compete with food, which is you know, the cellulosic feedstocks. So I believe that, that we're going to see uh, the growth of the cellulosic index, but not as fast as Congress anticipated, because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't fair to assume that the law passed in 2007 you know, by three, four years, you're going to have a billion gallons of an industry that was not existing. Well, they were leaving it to the okay. free market. Yeah. And, and the free market can't break lignin down into sugar, uh, you know, at $100, you know, at yeah. $50 oil yeah. competitively. It's too expensive. And I, that's why I think the root of all of our problems is still, the, you know, we need a cost of a price floor or something like that, or a price, you know, no matter what the world price of oil does, we're not going to, you know, get it for less than this. Wouldn't that be not quite a tax? You know, because if it goes back up naturally, then there's, it goes away. I mean, well, let me say, I I believe that one of the big issues, and now that I'm away from the outside of the government, I can say this, (laughs) I have freedom. Uh, And I'm citizen Margo, as I tell people. But, you know, when you look at the Clean Air Act um, back in the 70s, it's a fantastic law because it's a technology forcing, you know, but it doesn't dictate the industry how to get there. You know, for example, we told the industry for, you know, for, for the diesel, uh, the, the first diesel regulation, major regulation we did for 2007, you have to reduce diesel emissions, <coughs> NOx emissions in particular, by 90 percent under the Clean Air Act. We're going to give you lead time because that's what the statute requires, give industry lead time. And we're going to tell you how we think you're going to get there. But legally, we don't have to identify the exact right away. You know, you industry, you figure it out. And we said, you're going to use an oxajorber, most likely. We know that urea works, SCR works, but most likely companies will use an oxajorber because, you know, SCR, there is, you know, you have to, to assure that indeed it's going to be used. Guess what? The industry figured out a way to do it, and it was the SCR, but it wasn't EPA dictating to them what to do. What happened with the renewable fuel standard, unfortunately, Congress dictated to the industry 
how much ethanol to use, corn ethanol, how much cellulosic to use, how much biodiesel, rather than setting a performance-based standard and say, industry, oil industry, by X date, you have your carbon footprint for what your product you're selling has to be 10% less carbon. And another 10 years, 20%. And you figure it out, how, how it's going to happen. See, I love what you're saying. That That's certainly the way to approach it, because the schemes that we have today can be so complicated, constantly changing. It, it, it's a huge nightmare. But I want to switch gears slightly and get your reaction to this new development of connected cars. V to V, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, somewhere down the road, yeah, yeah, autonomous yeah, cars. Yeah. Because it seems to me that this could produce enormous improvements in fuel efficiency and emissions reduction. Yeah, yeah. Because if you can get a smoother traffic flow with all these cars yeah, talking yeah, to each yeah, other in yeah, the infrastructure, yeah. there are studies that go back to the 1980s that can show even with only a, a certain percent, 10% yes, percent of yes, the cars having yes. this capability, you can already start to measure yeah, the yeah. improvements. Yeah. Well, you know, I wish I was, uh, you know, by training, I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I wish I was a younger engineer and somehow uh, maybe don't go back to government we all and wish work. We were younger, <laughs> we were Margo, but, but they have so many. The engineers today must be so excited. I'm, I'm seriously. All the opportunities that exist in front of them to innovate. Okay, it's not anymore. Let's just innovate for a heavier car or more powerful car. And we don't have the the traditional place. We don't have just you know uh, the OEMs, the car OEMs. We have you know the Googles, potentially Apple. We have Tesla. So that is all very exciting. And as I was searching, uh, re researching the book about the car of the future, I'm very convinced that we're going to move people around this planet in a very different way than we moved people, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, or even 100 years ago. And I think uh, the connectivity, the Internet of Things, is going to play a big, pretty big role. I mean, look at it today. Uh, many people don't go to work. They telecommute. Uh, my girls don't go to the movies, they download. They do Instagram, they, they don't go to a restaurant with their friends. Uh, my oldest daughter does an Instagram with her. The food that she eats and everybody can see what she's doing. Young people in this country, in Europe, they don't get a driver's license. Even as soon as my daughter, went, my, my oldest daughter was a teenager, the first thing that she wanted to do was to drive. Not anymore, you see people you know, not really having, not just the interest, they don't need to because there are other ways to be connected. So the idea in my mind of, of a connected living that will translate to cars has a huge potential, not only for the future mobility, but for climate change, for air pollution and congestion and economic growth in, 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 in mega cities. Yeah. Uh so then you actually are, it seems, yes. very optimistic. I'm very optimistic. I mean, let's, let's look at autonomous car in isolation, uh, not connected with other vehicles on the road. Autonomous car, you know, we know by aggressive driving, and I know from myself because I'm an aggressive driver, I impact my fuel efficiency significantly rather than, you know, putting, you know, having a car with a driver that is calm like Frank, and I'm joking, Frank, <laughs> that, that, you know, just, you know, just drives gently. So you spend time parking. Okay, uh, just by those, and, and there are some analyses that I have seen. I have done some analysis for my book. Cisco has done some, some analysis. They're talking about 230 million metric tons of CO2 uh, reduced. We're spending 90 billion hours. That, you know, um, a, a colleague from Cisco told me just, you know, in congested parts of the country. Uh, that by itself, I think, in my, in just, just on isolation is going to decrease carbon. Now, some have suggested that we'll increase carbon. I tend to disagree because you have to look at autonomous cars, not just in isolation. Um, you have to look at them with lightweight materials, cars, uh, electric powertrain, share and on-demand service. And if you put all those together, then I think you're going to see uh, less accidents, less pollution, less fuel consumption, less, less congestion. Maybe from your perspective, you can tell us, because this yeah. vision of the future is disruptive in yeah. a lot of ways. Should we be concerned, for example, if all the cars are talking to each other, do we need car insurance anymore at all? That's a big lobbying effort. And could we expect some obstruction from the folks yeah. in that business? If we go to all electric, what happens to the oil companies? They certainly are 
number one on the list up there in terms of money sloshing around yeah. Washington. Yeah. So, so you know, when I was um, uh, interviewing for the book, I talked to David Strickland, who was the uh, administrator for NHTSA at the time. He stepped down since then. And he raised with me a number of issues, all the legal issues, you know, the liabilities, you know, who's liable. Um, there are concerns about breaking in, you know, to, to the car. We, we saw that in China with some Tesla cars. We saw it in one of the universities. Uh, in, again, you know, we, this is nothing new, and you have seen a lot of it with Internet, so I think, you know, companies like Cisco and others are working on all this. These are all issues that we're going to need to address as we're moving forward. But when it comes to the oil industry, um, you know, we need to be thinking and planning for a future without oil. Uh, and I remember, uh, and, and I have the story here in my book, I was telling John earlier, um, I had a discussion with um, um, one of the senior managers at the Koch brothers, uh, a, you know, a, a gentleman that I had worked with a number of years um, uh, addressing uh, the air, the, the quality of the fuel, you know, reducing sulfur, reducing benzene, and so forth. Uh, and we had very good working relationship with these guys. But they were not supporting what I call the Tier 3, uh, eventually, program that the agency supported. And what he said to me is, you know, Margaret, it's not about the Tier 3. It's what you guys are doing with the greenhouse gas standards. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me, you know, we're not talking to the oil industry anymore about making their product, you know, better for air quality. Okay. We're talking to the oil industry that eventually, if we believe, as, as the, the scientific community believes, and there are a few skeptics <laughs> out there, but there is a consensus that climate change happens because of burning fossil fuel and building greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we must not overnight get away from burning fossil fuel like coal and oil. Uh, and my hope is that the oil industry um, will invest on other forms uh, of energy, um, and including renewable fuels, cellulosic fuels, as some of them already are doing. Clearly, natural gas is a nice bridge, f especially for power uh, generation, you know, to replace coal. But the vision that all of us should have is an economy and without f oil or at least oil for fuel. There's plenty of other uses for yeah, oil, too. Uses, lubricants, lubricants, feed stocks, and a number fuel, of other exactly, things. Exactly. But you say, I'm we're just energy, not going to burn energy. it. Yes, burn it, burn it, yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, we're getting down towards the end here, Margo. What, what I'm curious is, you, you were at the EPA. You helped set these standards uh, for CAFE, Corporate Average Fuel Economy. As you noted, some automakers are ahead of the standard yes. right now. But as you know, too, in 2018, it does the hockey stick, yeah. and uh, the standards start to get a lot tougher. There is a midterm review then to see, is the industry able to keep up? Is, is the public keeping up? What's your sense of what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with you. I think oil prices will go up, but I've seen several studies that say it's probably going to settle in at around 80 to $85 a barrel. Toyota has told me that if gasoline is anywhere near $3 a gallon in the United States by 2018, it cannot meet the standard. Yeah. This is Toyota, the king of hybrids yeah. and plug-ins. Yeah. Yeah. So wh what's your sense? What is going to happen with the midterm review? Well, first of all, uh, I'm not at the agency anymore, but um, just, just to correct you a tiny bit. So what's, the, midter the purpose of the midterm review is to look at the standards after 2021. So the standards from 2012 to 2021 are set in place. So the review will be for 2022 to 2025, you know, for both cars and light duty trucks. And the agencies uh, have to evaluate all the assumptions that went into the standards. The, the standards are technology forcing, uh, and the benefits of the standards um, are significant. You know, $1.7 trillion fuel savings and carbon savings. So the agencies are gonna have to make a decision. Uh, I strongly believe that the standards will not change. But what if the footprint? Let me make it clear. Uh, the standards will not change. What potentially will happen as a result of, you know, if, if gasoline price, uh, prices stay low, which I don't believe will be uh, something that we're going to see beyond 2015, you know, 
time frame. But let's assume that the gasoline prices stay low for three years. You're going to see, as we're seeing now, people buying more trucks. But those trucks will be cleaner. So at the end of the day, we may not have the 54.5 standard met because we may have more trucks in the market than cars. But overall, we're going to still be saving oil and we're going to still be reducing the carbon pollution. Frank, you had a quick question. Yeah, so very so quick, because so we're down to the very so end So it's here. okay if, if the, the mix is not what the original mix was planned for those different footprints? If, if the prices have driven people into bigger, we, we don't need to change the, the standard? The, 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 the mix is based on the company. So the, if the company buy, produces more trucks, those trucks have a different footprint. Than the, than the car. So it's a footprint base. It's not a car. It, it's for the fleet as a, as a whole. It's not only car. But a fleet average is a yeah. little lower than they thought because people went there yeah. is okay. Yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. Margo, we could talk to you all day long okay. about this. Very interesting. I want to thank you for having come in. I want to take a look at this book, Driving the Future. There's a lot of good information in it. Frank, I want to thank you for having come along too. Very interesting. And uh, I've got a lot more to learn about all this. There's a lot to learn. Anyway, want to thank all of you for having tuned in and hope you all have learned something too. Underwriting for Auto Line this week has been provided by when it comes to meeting global mandates for fuel economy, Dow Automotive Systems is leading the way. We're the only supplier offering lightweighting capability supported by epoxy resin systems, structural, aluminum, and composite bonding adhesives, acoustical foam technologies, and carbon fiber systems that, when combined, work together as a complete solution. And our award-winning lightweight bonding solutions can be found in many vehicles on the road today. Affordable solutions from Dow Automotive Systems.